we've got a few hundred people in this live chat room, but there's hundreds and hundreds of more watching. Uh, so let's get started, shall we? So my name is Raleigh Latham. I am the co-host of the Sustainable Design Masterclass with Neil Spackman. Uh, first of all, I wanted to welcome you guys. Neil and I started this a few months ago because we thought we are living in such a chaotic world. We wanted to pre bring people on with an inspiring vision for the future and bring people on who are actually doing something about it. That's why, you know, we all need guidance in these chaotic times, which is why I am excited to bring on our guest. So Matt Powers is a permaculture educator, a writer, a musician, a family man, Jack of all trades, entrepreneur. Uh, he's been gardening for the past decade. He's been educating kids for the past seven years and teaching permaculture to adults and children alike for the past four years. So I was really excited to bring him on this time because he has a way of gardening that is really unique because despite living in extreme hot, dry climate in the Sierra foothills where there's wildfires and drought, he's still able to produce uh, much of his family needs on his two acre plot. And so without further ado, we're going to start our webinar on low stress, high yield gardening with Matt Powers. So take it away, Matt. Hey, everybody. Well, thank you so much for coming. I am just excited. Welcome. And you know what? Let's just dive right in because there's a lot to cover. Um, as he said, here, let's start the screen share. Let's go like this. Everyone can see it. We, we see it. We, it's good. All right, good. So we're talking about low stress, high impact garden design. And I'm Matt Powers. And some of you know who I am, but um, uh, probably a lot of you are wondering who I am. And I'm a family guy. Uh, I've got two boys and my wife. And we moved from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, because my wife got cancer and it totally threw a wrench into our lives um, and caused me to uh, reevaluate almost everything in my life. I was a musician and I went from being a professional musician to being a, a teacher in a public school, uh, teaching English and history and gardening and cooking and music and production um, because I needed to be close to home uh, to support my wife and uh, be there for my, my children. So uh, we live outside the Sierra Nevada, we live outside of Yosemite uh, National Forest. Uh, it is the forest that is, so uh, it's really kind of hard to um, look in the face sometimes because it is right in your face and people in our area tend to just either panic or try to ignore it. Um, but the forest is dying all around us and is burning constantly and it's not gonna regrow um, because of the climate change issues. We can talk about that a little bit later. But it's a pyrophytic landscape. It's always, I mean, that's a very serious thing in our area. But despite um, the great heat, the extremes, um, and despite the fact that really hardly anyone gardens in our area, we we have a, a serious garden, uh, and we have all this wildlife, and we we don't have fences. So, I I, I fell in love with gardening. Uh, I fell in love with seeds. I really love uh, growing food, and I really love nature. And so I, I went from this place of uh, being a musician to falling in love with nature here in California with the full year round gardening um, season. Because the, the reality, uh, we'll go back. The reality is that uh, California in the right area allows for year round gardening and you end up gardening more than you ever would in a cold temperate where you have three months, you have 12 months every year. So you, you, gain, you gain a lot. So um, in order to garden in this area, I had to learn permaculture. And as I learned permaculture, I wrote these books um, because that's how I think. I'm a teacher. I'm a, I have a master's degree in education. So when I learn something, the highest degree of, of learning is teaching. So if I don't understand it uh, to the point where I could teach it, um, I don't understand it in my opinion. So um, I, it's all crowd, uh, crowd uh, funded and it's all over the world now. It's really exciting. It's kind of written to the eighth grade level. Um, and so it's written to the newspaper level so everyone can read it and, and use it. Uh, and that's gone all over the place. And so let's talk about permaculture first. It started off as permanent agriculture. 
and then became permanent culture. And my definition, because a lot of people have different definitions, is a holistic design science based on the systems and patterns of nature that serves both the people and the planet regeneratively and ethically. So what that means is we're taking care of the earth and the needs of the earth and our ecology in our local area. We're taking care of the people, but we're caring for the future by returning a surplus from either of those, either of those um, things to the benefit of all. So uh, a lot of people think of it as care of future. I'm kind of moving towards care of future is a better way to understand it because if we're taking care of the earth, taking care of people, and we're saving for the future in the right sort of ways or investing for the future, then we have a permanent culture. So, you know, it may look like a fantasy. This is from my, uh, that book I was just showing you. Uh, but the reality is it's real. We had the Lus Plateau project in China. Um, this took six years to do. Uh, if you guys know um, the Lus Plateau, you can go to Google Earth. This is me flying over Google Earth. If you guys uh, know the history of China, you know that this area is the source of the Lus, uh, the, the Lus Silt that causes dust storms that um, fills the Yellow River, uh, which is also known as China's Sorrow. It's basically been a huge uh, ecological problem for 10,000 years. And it's also where modern agriculture started. And the two are linked for a very specific reason. Modern agriculture um, tillage basically uh, creates deserts. And we'll get into that later too. So all these problems that we see, that we all hear about um, in the news or on our uh, versions of the news or Facebook or, or anything, all have to deal with climate change and permaculture addresses all these things. But uh, the reason it matters to us today is because this is all happening in our garden too. So, and especially in mine, because we're on a, this desert of finding edge. So all of us need to understand permaculture if we want to garden better. Um, so let's start off with why, why are we gardening? Because uh, understanding why you are gardening uh, will help you be a better gardener. So are you, of course, growing fun food and you just want to grow something wild and crazy, go to rareseeds.com and get something fun. Uh, that's what I used to do. I love it. Uh, was it to grow the most food? Because I did that too and I love doing that. It's addictive because you, you start, you know, seeing the, the pile grow higher, right? Or is it to grow the best food because you're trying to uh, fight cancer or prevent cancer from returning or just not even deal with the whole thing altogether and just eat good food from the start? Uh, is it to provide habitat for wildlife, uh, for pollinators? Is it to build soil because your area has poor soils? Or is it to save seed? Are, are, you, are you looking to create a seed bank as part of your family's security? Or is it to teach it to your children or to a classroom? Or is it to share it because you want to give back? All these motivations, you know, they, they, they're all part of who we are in different degrees and at different times in our lives. So they really don't have to be separate goals. We can view them holistically and accomplish them all. Um, we all have the same constraints. We have um, time, money, and space, and energy, and, and it's all limited. Everyone's, uh, that is limited for everyone. So we're all in the same place. So reversing, uh, reverse engineering our diet is, is pretty critical to understand what, what, uh, what would be most valuable in our garden. So how much do you eat of blank, you know, per month and per year? I mean, you may eat tons of potatoes. You may eat tons of sweet potatoes. How much square footage and, uh, and, and, and time, how many days does it take to grow that much of that food? Uh, this is very important. This, you know, this, this will tell you if you can actually grow the amount of food you're eating on your land. You're like, oh, no, I've got less than a quarter acre. Well, it's like, whoa, well, you need to be very you need to understand what is possible in that space and then pick what you want because it's so limited. Um, how much will it cost in time, land, money, and seed? And this is where the energy in and the energy out really comes into play. And we really need to do this because we need to be wise with our time. Our time is limited and it's precious. Our time is what we spend with our family, uh, on ourselves. It's all the core things that we spend time on. It's, it's, it's very, very precious capital. Um, and, and land, uh, you can tweak that seed. Oh boy, we can tweak that, uh, money, um, seed can feed into that. You'll see. So if let's just take this example, 10 pounds of potatoes a month at 12 months, equals 120 pounds of potatoes a year. 
So that one pound of potato seed um, can grow 15 to 25 pounds of potato. Make sure to get the clean seed. You know, I know it's a little bit more expensive, but it's important to get clean seed. Um, one pound can plant a standard row of 10 feet, 60 feet of row, and uh, six pounds of potato seeds equals 150 to 90 pounds, depending on your yield, because I always do spectrums in, for bad and good years, you know? Total cost, uh, $4 a pound times six is $24 for 90 to 150 pounds of potatoes plus water and labor inputs. So this really gives you a clear idea and a clear understanding of, of, of what potatoes would take to do in your area. The one thing that you don't have in here uh, would be time, uh, but it's, it's really, uh, most people can do potatoes in cold climates and um, depending if you're doing it in the winter, it can be done in some of the hotter, hotter climates. So time, well, there's digging, there's cutting, there's, uh, there's planting, well, there's planting, there's cutting back the, dry, the dying tr top so that it dries down and the skin hardens for two weeks, right? Harvesting, and then there's waiting, and then the costs are compost, water, seeds, and storage space. We can only grow what makes sense for our climate, our site, diet, and time and energy. That's why people, you know, if you don't eat it, don't grow it. Um, so what grows well in your area? Well, that takes asking around. Go to the farmer's markets, um, go to gardening classes in your area, go to garden tours, go see what grows well um, because that, that's going to be um, what's going to lead you uh, to the strongest results, to the highest yields uh, for the least amount of input. So in my area, this is my soil. Um, it's decomposed granite granite and it's you can see a couple spots where there's organic matter in here if you if you just lean in close to the screen um yeah and so it's basically all becoming sand um and there's a little bit of organic matter but it's just highly mineralized which is good on one hand you just got to bring organic matter and then keep it cool because it's 140 degrees in full sun two inches deep uh, I know a lot of us are dealing with rising temperatures, and so that's why I feel this really helps. And you know what? Um, I'm sure that Neil Speckman is going to be doing uh, a talk on this webinar, too, in the future. So be sure to sign up for future webinars because he's going to be dealing with soils that are 160 Fahrenheit. So he's going to show us the future uh, for some of our areas that we're going to have to deal with. And we're going to adapt, and we're going to handle this because it is possible to lower that to below 80. And we'll get into that, too. So this is a dry farming patch. This is growing in that 140 degree soil. It is uh, Kinopodium natalia. It is uh, horizontal red aztec spinach, the original tortilla grain before corn. Um, this is uh, where you can see the trees are dying off, but if you actually get in really close, you can see that it's actually not one hill face. It's actually, there's some contour going on and there's some foreground and background with that hill. And you can see that those trees are just dying. There's dead standing trees, there's dead burnt ones, and the ground below it is barren. There's some weeds, but that's it. So it's really, really kind of scary when you see the actual ecology, the natural ecology around you in this area. Um, the air is also awful here. We're above Fresno. It's Fresno's second, uh, uh, or it's always in the top five, but sometimes it's second worst air in America. Um, Bakersfield's the worst usually, way worse than LA, like way worse. Um, and we, we breathe their air um, at night. And as a parent, you know, that freaks me out. Um, and so I created these lungs around the house, the biological filters of this, this, this burgeoning or nascent food forest. So it's family land, I don't own it. Um, it's my wife's grandparents' land. Um, they're retired. Uh, it's a brittle Mediterranean climate. Uh, we're below Yosemite, above Fresno. We're next to a highway, so that's why some of my videos has that constant highway sound. We're on a well that we just had to redrill um, because it dried out, and people's wells are drying out all over the place up here. And then the seasonal fire is increasing by leaps and bounds. Um, some weeks we've got dozens of fires now. So no fences. Uh, no offense. They just don't work. Uh, in our area, they just don't work. If they want your food, the bears will break through. If they, it, it, the bobcats are bigger than my dog. The the deer are mighty and beautiful and jump very high. You you just got to do other things. We'll get into that too. Uh, we have plenty of wildlife and space, uh, and we have to share that space. So, this area is right next to a really prolific area. 
there really is no soil difference or area difference. It's just I planted root crops here and beans. And over there, I planted something else. And we'll talk about what's over there. It's, it's, it's the multi-canopy um, that, 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 that I've alluded to online. So research your area and then conduct experiments. I've literally been conducting experiments in my area for a decade. And it's because everyone's like, you can't garden here, good luck. I mean, that's exactly what I was told when I, was at, when I asked permission to start gardening is like, good luck. Don't prepare yourself for heartache, you know. Um, and so I've been conducting experiments, and I and and we'll get into some of those in a bit. So my way and why, uh, sweet. All right, it's eleven fifteen. We're already on my way and why. This is perfect. We're gonna get everything in. You guys are gonna get your Q and A in. We're gonna get. You guys are gonna have such a good time. This is gonna be awesome. We're gonna be able to apply this and make such a difference in your garden. Here we go. I go vertical uh, because if you have a limited amount of space you want to go vertical. And um, if the sun is strong in your area, like it is in the Central Valley, they do not mean full sun. Packed may say full sun. They don't mean full sun. Half the, half the seeds are grown that we buy in wet climates. Because guess what? You can grow a lot of seed when it's, uh, you know, it's got all these great growing conditions. But in the hard edge where it's hard to grow things, people aren't doing seed companies because it's harder to grow large amounts of seed. So what's going on is everyone has to adapt their seed to the area. And uh, another thing that's going on is, is the so solar energy is too much for most of these plants. So they burn. Um, and even here in this photo, if you look to the right and the bottom, you can see that there's burning on that, that bean plant. Meanwhile, that is a 14 foot high corn surrounded by 12 to 8 foot high corn, 6 foot high corn surrounded by millet that's like 4 to 5 feet tall with sorghum mixed in, which gets like 6 to 9 feet tall. And so it's all these different layers all mixed in and providing different. It's all about the vertical shade. If, I don't know if you guys have ever heard about uh, how they build um, cities in the dry areas in the arid regions of the world. They do really tall buildings that are skinny. So it lets the sun in for a moment and then it's again passing. So the soil only gets hit by the direct above sun for like a small period of time and then it's blocked again by this vertical shading. Um, anyway, uh, so Below this, and this is the first year I was ever able to get good heads of cabbage, at the bottom, below all these layers, I have winter crops growing because they have so little solar energy. So it's not the heat that is determinant for some of these winter crops, but it is the solar energy. And a lot of times we get these things confused because we don't test them and see that they're separate. So I'm growing winter crops in summer in 140 degree soil temperatures, 10 feet away from this with, with canopies, multiple canopies. Uh, and also planting densely. I really plant densely. And this is like a bio-intensive thing. If you guys talk to Jean Martin Fortier or Curtis Stone, I mean, they're planting square inches. They're not planting every four inches, six inches, 12 inches. No, they're boom, 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 boom. They're on it. And it's because it uh, creates a canopy, which the moisture is not released. Think about it. If there's an interception for a mist and it's flowing upwards, if it intercepts a plant with all those hairs covering it, it's just going to coat that plant. The plant's going to suck it back in, back down to the soil, and respire again. This actually creates a closed, not a completely closed loop, but more of a closed loop moisture system. So while I water, all the water that could be dried off by that sun, you know, is held a lot more because it's being cycled and shaded. This is another example. Um, this, the, the paths themselves become these huge sinks. And it, I might have to start uh, adopting this, but in really dry areas, they grow in the swale. They grow in um, concave beds because that's where the water goes, where it wicks to. Um, I have to grow soil first. Most people need to grow soil first, and that may not mean the same thing. Justin Rhodes talks about how he has organic matter but no nitrogen. To me, I'm like, oh, well, there's plenty of nitrogen. You just have to unlock it, right, with a soil food web. And so, you know what I mean? And he was just, he put supplements in, and that works too. Um, 
and those are food, you know, and, 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 and whatnot too. But um, I grow my soil. So I tend to use plants to grow my soil. Uh, and then I use compost tea to grow my soil. So I inoculate uh, the, the, uh, the ground and the, the, the soil life unlocks those things. So it's a lot easier than buying amendments to me because I can make compost and I can just plant cowpeas. Uh, and cowpeas are amazing and I'll get into those a little bit later too because there's something magic about those or just amazingly powerful, whatever word you want to choose. So chop and drop, perpetual mulch. Um, my weeds get chopped all the time and they're constantly coming back and um, it's great. It's not a bad thing. Um, they're not sucking up the nutrients. They're actually gathering nutrients so that I can chop them and then they create awesome mulch and then awesome nutritious um, uh, topsoil as it breaks down. So this right here, actually, I want to let you guys know something very specific about this. This, I, I could, didn't add this, but I will add this. This chop and dropping of weeds cools the soil as much as wood chips. I'll say it again. The weeds that we are worried about if we chopped and dropped would be as good as the uh, Eden's garden or garden uh, the way Eden does. You know that the guy has a tons of mulch. If he just had let the weeds grow and just chopped them, it would have been the same thing, especially in his climate because he's all, um, he's all uh, non-brittle and I'm super brittle. So, uh, well, not as brittle as Neil Speckman over there in Saudi Arabia. But um, yeah, so it's serious. These weeds are here to help. So let's just look for a second at, at the reality. So not water is 140. Water but bear is just below um, 120. So it's like 115. And then um, the mulch is like 75. And the um, that's it. it's it's. It's just about the same uh, temperature. It might be a little bit warmer with the um, chop and drop mulch, which is weeds. Um, and if if we're talking about composting, um, not watered section is already composting. It's sanitizing in the soil. So it's pretty serious. So living fences, like I mentioned earlier, are biological barriers. So if you look to the left, you can see my system end. And it just becomes barren after this. And, and it's just all stubble and the soil is dusty or rock hard either it's either just we'll just erode in the in a first rain event or it's rock hard and whatever mulch is on top will get washed away it's either or in our area so that's why swales are really important in our area and i know a lot of people don't like swales um, because they're like farmers and they and, or graziers and they want to just rip and put swales on the bottom and top like a key line pattern and that's fine all things where they're appropriate. There's not either or. You could be doing ripping and swales and, and, and terraces. You know, people say terraces above swales and key line above terrace. You know, it's just, you know, no need to do any of that. Um, they have appropriate places. So, um, oh yeah, let me finish. So basically, if you look at the edge, I have amaranth like an army along my edge and the deer come up and start eating at the edge. And even in the paths, I've left them growing because they'll walk into the path and just start eating there instead of going further in. So, and also because it's flat, the deer don't like walking along the path. It feels like they went to the airport or something. Stable diversity, uh, trial great, uh, trialing great diversity is the only way to create stable diversity. So I have had to, I've definitely tried almost 2000 um, different garden varieties now. Um, I've, I, I, I love rareseeds.com, uh, Seed Savers Exchange. If you can get in the GRIN database, the USDA uh, database of, of germplasm. Um, I like, um, there's a bunch of others. I like, I even, I even like uh, Johnny Select Seed for um, buying cowpeas in bulk sometimes uh, or peas in bulk sometimes uh, for winter, uh, winter cropping. So you got to plan it. You got to go there. You got to see what's going on because if you don't know what's going on, you don't know what's good. And if you don't know what's good, you're never going to know what you really want in life. Because if you don't taste the rainbow, you don't know what is even there in the rainbow. Um, so going back to compost, compost, decompost, extract. A lot of people don't know the difference between these things. Hot compost is the best compost because it's made with a thermophilic reaction that keeps it at 130 to 140 
degrees Fahrenheit, remember, composting heat, right? It kills parasite eggs, weed seeds, and human pathogens. So it makes like sterilized compost that you can like lick your fingers after working with, as Elaine, you know, pointed out in one of our videos uh, that's in the course. Um, and it makes this long carbon chain. That's what's so black about it. Uh, it's a reverse process of burning oil, um, but it does let off CO2 um, when you do it this way, but it, it makes it so that you can run a garden or a market garden without um, any seeds, any having to weed and doing all that stuff, which if you're doing densely planted things um, of just that one thing, like in a market garden, that's, you know, that's your thing. Uh, polycultures, you can do densely too in the same way and they'd be more beneficial. But, you know, you follow your own path and you'll get to where you're going. So sh this is her talking about this from one of our videos. Uh, vermicompost is made by worms. Uh, they don't digest the weed seeds, but they do sterilize it. Um, and that's great. Uh, we use worm compost uh, because it's really passive. So you just toss everything into the pit um, and then just turn it so the worms can get new stuff and stuff gets buried by dirt and doesn't stink or anything like that. So that's, that's I mean, most people do the worm compost and they're like, yay. And then they're like, huh, there's still weeds. But, you know, that's it's because it's got to stay up to temperature. So compost extract is watered compost and whatever leaks out of it is extract. Compost tea is when you aerate it in a compost like tea bag. So it's a mesh bag that suspends in water and you, you, you uh, vigorously aerate it with like a, vigor, like a $50 air pump. And it, it creates this golden brown tea colored liquid and our plants love it. Uh, a lot of people use molasses. Um, the thing with molasses, you can see the bottom left there, I was using it back then, um, is it's bacterial food. So if you're using molasses, it's going to favor weeds um, unless you're already in a super acidic region and you're clearing old growth forest and want to put in a garden. But I don't really recommend that. So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, if you want to take uh, something that's bacterial and flip it backwards, put wood chips uh, into a compost heap and then do that. Woody compost heaps make fungal dominant compost. And then the fungal uh, dominant compost tea will help, um, help you in the garden fight the weeds. And I'll get into that too. All right, so legumes. Uh, legumes are critical. Uh, they're nitrogen fixers. Uh, they're going to... Um, cover your ground. They're going to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere with rhizobium um, bacteria, which is root nodules, which are really just um, rhizobium atta attached to the, uh, the root hair and send it a signal and sends down sugars. They combine the nitrogen. Uh, most people don't know this. They combine the uh, nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen with the sugars to make amino acids. And uh, these amino acids, um, uh, they're pre-proteins, right? Um, they are why people get protein out of beans. <laughs> yeah. And so nitrogen is like really critical for like protein. And if you don't have nitrogen, then the food's going to be lacking in protein. So these guys are pulling out of the atmosphere and they, and they uh, focus at that energy in their um, seeds and pods and leaves. And so you have to chop and drop. You have to chop and drop it. And you really have to consider letting some of the seeds go because otherwise you, you're you giving up some of the amazing magic that's happening. And in the background, you can see a black locust, which is also uh, that, that thing we chop, uh, and it keeps coming back. So these, these legumes are really critical to building up the soil, and it, without them, without cowpeas specifically, um, and I'll tell you why cowpeas are awesome in a minute. Um, so water automation, uh, it's 11.30, we're on time, great. Watering automation. So I do use sprinklers. And if I was wealthy, I would trial many more other different things. But this is the cheapest, the fastest, and the easiest way to do it. And for me and my family right now, that's what works. And I'm sure that many people who um, don't have money pouring out of their pockets uh, aren't, you know, don't want to spend tons of money on doing drip line over two acres. Um, so I just do this, and I make uh, this stuff happen. And I have things set to every six hours, uh, nine minutes, you know, starting at like 7 a.m. And I stagger them so that everyone's getting, everyone's starting and stopping at different times uh, so that I don't have to put pressure on my well. Because, you know, you know the, the reality is the, the, the pressure thing, 
um, is very, very real, especially if you get into the drip line thing. I would have to get a repressurizer. Uh, uh, and I might do that in the future at some point on uh, my own property. So the easiest way to grow annuals, and these are the garden things that are seeds that we save and then everyone talks about when we think of gardening, um, is throw so. As much as you can, but throw so. And a lot of people are like, what are you talking about, throw so? You're literally taking the seeds and throwing them on the ground. Um, and that's what this is. I literally walked on the path and threw it and walked away. And it was all automated, so I would just walk through every once in a while and look and enjoy and, and that's it like that's what i'm trying to explain to people when it comes to time um uh, uh, justin's going to do a homesteading a video on 10 hour homestead he's got a cow he's got chickens he's got you know all this production i'm just talking about gardening and um this is like hmm i do have a couple hand cranks as you saw there i have three hand crank um, ones that I don't feel like buying a $40 timer because I'm here this summer mostly. So I don't feel like buying a $40 new timer, you know? Um, and so I literally just crank the timers twice a day and that's fun walk. So that's like a five minute, maybe seven minutes a day. So this, this garden um, is about three months old. It takes, this area doesn't have a crank on it. So this area, I've only been in this area harvesting. Planting probably took 20 minutes. Um, and it's that's it. I've done nothing in this area. That's what I'm trying to explain to people. I garden and I don't spend any time gardening because it's it's just it's, it's awesome like this. Um, so uh, when we minimize direct seeding, we minimize disturbance. You can see that the soil is cut here. And because the soil has already been cut here a few times, um, the, it's really granularized, uh, and uh, the the moles love it here. The more you cut, the easier it is for the moles to to play in, and they love that. They love it loose. So just keep that in mind. Throw so is ultima. Uh, so seed saving though is real gardening, like I alluded to before, um, because a you only buy seeds once, but b you're adapting those seeds to your area. Uh, so that they become these self-seeders. This is um, mustard. I, this is a land race. They created of 12 different kinds of mustard from all over the world. And they've got all this variation and they just self-seed and run. I don't plant mustard. It's already there. It's doing its thing. Um, and this is amaranth. And, you know, I really didn't need to plant very much amaranth this year. It was already sprouting up most places. But then um, I actually have an entire wheelbarrow full of dried amaranth from last year that I didn't seed save yet. So I've just got it coming out my ears. Um, and it's a grain that people buy at Whole Foods. Uh, they get the millet, quinoa, and sorghum mix for like $20 a bag, five pound bag. So this is just like tons of food. And the dried stuff that I have that's in the wheelbarrow, that's what I plant with. I literally just go out and just scrabble it up with my hands, you know, and then and then it's all over the soil and I just walk away. You know, you can skip while you do it too. Um, if you like. So adapted seeds are always better seeds. Uh, like I said, they're growing them in wet areas, um, like these carrots, okay? So I started growing carrots a few years ago and they instantly bolted. And I'm like, what's going on? Because they just, boom, instant bolt. And so what I realized, and I just let it go. I didn't pull it up, I just let it go to seed. I was like, fine, you wanna go to seed? I'll save your seeds. And some of them I saved, some of them I just let go. And what happened was in the next, crop was thicker and bigger and i was like okay so you waited a little longer you thickened up a little bit this and so I let it go to seed again and so what happened after three years is i started getting full-size uh, carrot seed i mean carrot full-size carrot roots and it, it that's really what it takes it takes adaptation uh, for some things to really uh take on and things that do really well you need to save those seeds because those things are going to be unreal when you really dial in their genetics to your area because their genetics are dialed in every season to the area where it's hot or drought or wet or whatever. So uh, flowers, I let everything go to seed also because they flower and most of the things I'm growing are actually things that attract biological pest controls like um, uh, lettuce and, and 
onion and all these different like things that are just normally growing in our gardens. If you and they're in my book, you'll if you get my book, you'll you'll have a list of these things. But the, they're all things we're growing already, and you just let them go to seed. And oh, that's your pest control. And it was like oh, and that's also my seed. It's this holistic stacked answer to a problem. People are like oh, there's so many bugs. Ah, you know. Well, that's how we take care of that. You have lots of flowers, lots of things going to seed. So self-seeding annuals actually imitate perennials because they don't require you to cut the ground. I'm fro sowing, so I'm not cutting the ground. And it's not and it's and so they're like not they're annuals, but they're not quite annuals like the way we traditionally um, garden or farm. So let's get into this because uh, I know this is something that um, is really critical to talk about annual versus perennial. Um, this is from my second book. This is created with Dr. Elaine Ingham and I. This took um, uh, we we did a few. Um, we've done about six of these uh, diagrams for the new book together, and she recently just finished going over my forty-five page soil chapter, and uh, she gave me my highest academic compliment by telling me that uh, it only has a few small mistakes and that it's good which is crazy, um, amazing, I'm because it was her first reading of it uh, and no one else had get critiqued it. So I, I, I read her stuff well, I did it, you know, and I'm super excited about that. And this is one of the gems that I gained from her. And my book really is a product of working with people like Dr. Elaine Ingham, but all over the world and in all different disciplines. And the understanding that I've gotten from her and all these other individuals is so just so valuable, so unbelievable that I, I have to share it with everyone and it's going to change the world. Um, it's an update on Bill Mollison's uh, original permaculture design textbook and it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the world. I can't wait to share it. So uh, alkaline, if you have bacterial dominant soils, that's weeds. Why? Well, because they eat nitrates. So um, when you cut the ground, um, and, and it, well, I'll get to that, hold on. Uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum, fungal dominant as the evergreen trees were, uh, you know what I mean, the, the big forest and everything. And then right in the middle, we have highly productive rural crops. They need a balance of both nitrate and ammonium. So when we cut our fields and mix in an amendment and say, now you shall be nitrate, that screws it up or ammonium that screws it up and we'll get into that in a second because nitrates feed vegetative growth this is why when you get too much nitrate or if there's nitrates in the soil or too much chicken manure you just no no fruit will grow you get all this green vegetative growth it's boom 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 growth 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 but then there's no ammonium in the soil because you're all bacterial dominant covered in nitrates with the, the chicken manure so perennials thrive in ammonium, uh, thrive with ammonium, but they also need a little bit of nitrate to do their uh, vegetative growth. So vegetative growth is important, nitrate is important to both. Um, reproductive growth, the seeds and the fruits, you have something that instantly bolts, something that are just boom, it's not gonna grow, it's just short, oh man, what's going on? It's because you, you got ammonium in that soil, it's acidic. Uh, and everyone's like, oh, I need to change my pH. But you guys know that pH changes every micrometer, right? So pH test where you shake it up with the water is meaningless. And it's also misleading uh, because it changes every micrometer and it changes from like pH four to pH nine. So it's seriously different. We're talking about like, we're talking that about how soil science and our understanding of soil science and gardening 10 years ago was completely wrong. And that's why Elaine is work so critical. Okay, so disturbance restarts secession. You cut that soil, you go back to um, you go back to bacterial. You go back to the beach. Tillage destroys the fungi and creates conditions for weeds to thrive because weeds are reparative mechanisms. So perennial staple foods really are the future because we're we need those stable um, those the stable ecology in the soil. Um, so we need uh, to not cut, we need to trap the carbon, and we'll get into that part too, but we need to buy from perennial farms. We need to eat perennial foods and we need to grow perennials. And you know, I mean, the thing is, look at this, carbon uh, or perennial farming, they're really similar or the same, depending on your point of view. So we need to be trapping carbon. That's what happens when we don't cut the soil and we're constantly building soils or trapping moisture by creating shade. 
and not cutting the soil. We were charging the groundwater by creating shade and dropping moisture. It's building soil life. We're cooling things. Um, we're creating precipitation because perennial uh, and carbon farming implies trees. Um, and uh, at least on the edges of your field or through and, and going alley cropping, uh, we're, we're creating ecological and economic and thus social stability because these farms are helping the environment while they're making a profit. So they're making for a more stable future. People who are doing it are like Mark Shepard. This is a new forest farm in Wisconsin, 106 acres, and it's a polycultural food forest. And he's really doing it. And the reality is it's less work, less costly, and less damaging because you put the tree in once and then its value skyrockets every single season. Uh, so let's talk about my best performers. So uh, small grains, because it's so hot, the smaller grains do really well. And then I'm also not competing with raccoons, uh, like with corn, I'm competing with, uh, and if you got raccoons, do them close to the house. Um, I'm, not, I'm only competing with birds. And the birds are going to prefer a certain grain. They're going to prefer that top right millet one uh, over sorghum and over amaranth. And I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if um, I don't know if the horizontal is is even eaten by birds. I've, yeah, I've yet to really see that uh, take a hit. Um, oh, storage squash. Squash is a staple crop in this area. So what's going on is they're, they just take off and they just love growing hair. They cover up the soil, they create shade. And um, this is all one table. And this is my storage squash, not the summer squash, not the squash I already ate. Most of the largest squash aren't even in this picture because we already made food with them for the course. So this is what's left over for my storage for, um, for the winter. And I still have squash from this batch out front of my studio. Still a year late, well, more than a year later. So long-term storage squash is critical uh, for food storage for me. It's my living food storage. They have seeds inside them that can sprout new food, or I can eat the sprouts. They themselves are food. I mean, heck, you can even take them, and uh, you see how they all have that kind of uh, coat, that dusty coating? That's um, wild yeasts. So you could even create um, uh, an alcohol with them. Um, and, and, and then make tinctures and stuff or whatnot. Um, and you know what I mean? So you can, you can do crazy amounts of things with these things. And, uh, most people don't really understand that. It's very underrated. And most of it was throw cell. Is that crazy? I, I, it was a test. I was trying to see, and I threw out, um, seeds that I had already adapted thinking that maybe these guys will know what to do. And they did. So always test things, legumes, beans, and peas. These things do so well here because they're reparative mechanisms. Um, up front, we've got uh, a lot of different kinds here. Uh, these are mostly um, beans and fava beans, but there's some vetch um, and uh, some other uh, interesting things going on there. And the idea is that these, um, these the, the best is cow peas. They, all right, this is, a, there, there have been studies done on this. They create the most biomass and they fix the most nitrogen out of any plant on the planet. And if you look to the top right there, I'm inoculating with a rhizobium bacteria. So in other words, when I throw that, because it's pre-soaked, and then I added the rhizobium bacteria um, right before and let it soak in for like, I think, an hour, ha half an hour or something. And then I put that on there. What's happening is that it's already preloaded with what it needs. So it'll form those root nodules and change the soil super fast. Very easy to do. Root crops, that's something that super, does super well here. I think it's because um, the higher mineral content. But at the same time, they get eaten. So you have to plant really densely, and you have to plant in you know, a polyculture, so you hide things. Uh, the brassicas really help. Uh, nightshades. So um, night, the <laughs> you guys like tomatillos, right? That's from rareseeds.com, the gigantic tomatillo. I don't know if uh, other people are getting them this big, but uh, nightshades do really well here, and I love them. And they come back. They self-seed. Brassicas. So your kale, your uh, collard greens, your cabbage, um, your mustard, uh, your turnips, your radishes. They do really well here, um, and that's because they're actinobacterial, I think, and they're leading us through the, um, the stages of secession. So when it 
when it's sterilized sand, you know, it's it's the beach. And so we're up on the weedy side of things. And that's why there's weeds everywhere every year. But these are the next step. These are the edges of the beach. Um, sea kale, you know, that's what it originally was. It was like uh, on the beaches of, uh, of France. So we have to uh, recognize where these things are from. Oh, whoa. Let's do that again. Sorry. <laughs> um, so those were the annuals. Those weren't even those weren't even perennials. All right. So let's talk about perennials. Cane fruit. Um, <laughs> cane fruit uh, uh, is just another name for uh, raspberries, blackberries, loganberries, all those berries that are awesome that we love that spread vegetatively. Um, strawberries do really well here. Uh, they love the understory. Uh, this is the first year that I've had them this far into summer consistently. And it's probably because I have 12 varieties. Um, actually, no, I have 13 now because I got the tutti fruity flavored ones um, from rareseeds.com. Uh, yeah, I, I just love them. You can see in the, the, the background there, that's a whole hill of ever bearing uh, strawberries. And it's under, it's in the shade because strawberries like shade because that's where they're from. Artichokes, artichokes go really well here. Sometimes they do get eaten. Um, but they grow fast and they produce well, so we're and they spread. So I think if I just get them above a certain threshold, um, no matter how much they get eaten, they'll always stick. Um, and that's what I'm seeing so far. Grapes are another awesome, awesome thing here. And we're Mediterranean, right? So grapes uh, make sense. Uh, Wonderberries are something I've talked about. Uh, they're a nightshade that's perennial in our area because of the heat. Their bases, their roots never die off, and they spread like mad. And they're the first nightshade you can get. Olives, oh man, yeah, I mean, Mediterranean, right? We get olive oil like crazy, we get olives like crazy. Uh, they're delicious, and they don't require very much water, and so they're kind of an ideal crop for the future for this area. And, you know, I have friends on the other hill who have an uh, olive, uh, olive farm, and they do olive oil, so it's definitely something I knew would do well. So uh, herbs, herbs do really well here. Um, and uh, comfrey, um, feverfew, um, I mean, they're everything you can think of does well here. That's an herb. Uh, we're on, in the foothills uh, of a mountain and we get frost. But uh, like I said, we, we hit 110 in summer ambient temp. So these are all quick establishing perennials, if you noticed. And they're what I've proven. I have other things going on. But those are super high yields because you plant them once and then just start spreading and take off. Stuff that people say, oh, that might be invasive, but it's really good food. Those are the kind of things that you want to grow because then you're into management of the food rather than daycare of the food. You know, you're not there babying it. You're instead keeping it from overtaking an area pruning it and harvesting it so it's very very cool and then um the seedlings that you get uh you can sell to friends or relocate and spread your um, food out so planting gills this is where we're going to talk about um uh, tr the trees that i have planted because look see how they're young um that's why i'm not like oh look at all the food on these trees i just planted these um and most people are just starting off in their food forests there's very few people with a decade or older food forests at this point um, and in my area, there's nothing like that. So uh, you can clearly see my swales. You can clearly see that it's all just weeds with trees planted in it. Um, and the shrouded food forest is really stone fruit, pomegranates, mulberry, pears and apples, uh, grapes, and cane fruit at this point, with a lot of those understory things I just talked about in there, like comfrey and artichoke and... Um, so, and then there's these support legumes. These are really critical. So you have your valuable trees and you have your support legumes. These could be annuals, but that requires you to keep doing work um, and collecting seed and all that. But if it's a tree, then you can just chop all its branches off and then the correlating roots that die off, um, those rhizobium nodules get eaten. And when they're digested, they release all their nutrients back to the soil, to the plants. So the food soil up needs to be active for this to work. If you're doing this without these elements, you're going to have a seriously hard time. And this is part of the reason why legumes uh, were used um, in the desert. This is part of why um, they're, they're being used to establish areas with nothing on it um, because of, because of that, 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 that soil life, because of their nitrogen fixation, and because of uh, the way they tie the land together really quickly. 
This is Siberian pea shrub. Um, this is a great one too. These are young yet. I haven't really trimmed them yet like I'm doing to the black locust. I'm going to trim this this year and get a straight trunk going so that it goes up and just creates a, a straight canopy rather than going outward. I mean, goes up and then creates a canopy outward above us rather than from, from the, uh, at our height. And that way it creates a, a clear roof um, for, for things. So, um, and then I'll top it at some point too. I'll get on a ladder and top it so that it doesn't keep going up. And I'll have to do that routinely uh, unless I want to let it go. So um, mulch plants. Um, and well, but Siberian pea shrub will, um, it's smaller, so it should handle that really well. Uh, this has already been topped. So mulch plants, this is um, right here. This is clover. Uh, I have, I planted white clover. I had strawberry clover show up. And I have red clover somewhere too. And I didn't plant them. They just showed up. And it's really, really exciting when those kind of things just happen. And I can just cut this back and it will regrow. And this is the base like Fukuoka used in a lot of my areas. And I love it. Um, this is another uh, good example of a mulch plant. It's an annual. Um, I let the seeds go. I take the seeds. But then at the end of the season, I chop this down. And it's really, really good. Same thing here. We're just creating more soil. Um, and the multiple canopy gardening is really what helps me because I'm keeping that solar energy minimized. I'm, I'm, because it's just so hot, it's just so intense that minimizing the amount of energy that gets to those growth points is really facilitating a lot, of, all, all, all the stability. So, successional gardening is really what I'm doing. I'm using annuals um, to shade, to feed, uh, to build the soil for my food forest, which will take over. And that's what's cool about the site is it's family land. So I'm really preparing it as a gift to them um, for uh, letting us live here this long and experiment and play and all these different things on this land. And so I'm going to leave them with an automated system that will continue to mature and will self-seed and i'm going to check up on it uh, once a year twice a year um, and they're going to self-seed and it's all going to start running itself uh, without me just doing anything i'm really excited about that i'm really really excited about that so um, i i encourage other people to embrace this if they can uh, so because the future is regenerative i don't know if you can see me right there in the middle in the background that's it kind of gives you the scale of, of the garden um, and this is only one side of the hill. I have uh, another garden area that is twice as big as this and another garden area that is half the size of this. And then I have the dry, the, dry, the dry farm patch. So do you want to learn more? Well, I've got this course. And um, what happened was I was, a, uh, I was this educator at this high school where everyone had laptops. So all the curriculum was online. So it my permaculture passion, uh, my cooking passion, all this stuff came together and I created this online course um, that's over 12 hours of video. We have over 150 pages of worksheets, projects, even coloring for the little kids to keep them busy, activities for adults, for kids. Um, it works for the whole family. Um, you can move quickly through it, uh, skipping over things that aren't, don't interest you or you can dive in and do all the challenges. Um, but it includes my ebooks. It's got seed to table cooking. It's got seed saving, food preservation, animal husbandry, entrepreneurship, because that's really critical for helping uh, people monetize these things. Uh, weekly plant focuses to introduce new things that you don't know about. Um, and so, and, and we have a group where we, we, we talk and we pose questions and we give regular feedback uh, within our community. And, you know, if I can't answer it, uh, there's plenty of people uh, that I work with um, that are part of the team and part of my course that can answer it too. So this is uh, Eric Olson. He is up in Sebastopol. He uh, helped start the Permaculture Skills Center. They're an incredible uh, school and program. And uh, he he's here talking to us about his backyard in my course. We got Elaine Ingham uh, giving her expertise on compost. We got the Permaculture Skills Center tour. We, we go visit Guayaki. Um, we visit the, the Petaluma Seed Bank. 
um, I mean, we were even uh, crystallizing, you know, candying, um, you know, Buddha's hand uh, citrus here. Uh, I talk about, you know, having to work with squash. And my, I go through my whole seed collection and you get the, you get free eBooks with it. Um, and you can actually buy the, the, the physical books with it. That's an option. But my books are designed so that they're like reading a newspaper or uh, a Harry Potter. You know, it's designed to be easy because this stuff really is easy and it shouldn't be that challenging. Um, and this is my introductory level. I've got a workbook, this is from the workbook, that takes all that learning and applies it directly to your site. So it takes you through step by step. These, this, this workbook really is the information that um, Jeff Lawton taught me in his online course. Um, and it takes you through how to test your site, what to do on your site. Um, and what's really cool is this time through, um, just for you guys, we've got a special offer. And we're pre-ordering um, The Permaculture Student 2, which is my new book, which is for adults and high schoolers. And it's going to be the new standard. Um, we have things like Fungi has its own chapter. We've got things like uh, Aquaculture as its own chapter, uh, Alternative Energy, Urban Permaculture, Invisible Structures. Um, we've got uh, Large uh, Landscape Repair. We've got Case Studies. Um, and it's really talking about permaculture as a lens. It's not just herb spiral or swale. I mean, those things are very specific and they have specific functions. Like a Hugo culture is to deal with excess wood, not to build your garden. It's to deal with excess wood uh, that you already have. So I cover the normal things like patterns of nature. Um, like we go through the climates. Uh, I, Neil Speckman uh, is actually uh, the peer reviewer and uh, editor for uh, the arid section. Uh, but I also cover planting techniques, um, clever plant breeding, because this is all important stuff. Um, we have an entire funded chapter, as I said, with uh, Peter McCoy of Radical Mycology is helping me out with that. Um, we've got things like accurate carbon cycles that are easy to understand um, because most people aren't getting that in their high school textbooks or online when they Google search. We're, uh, Elaine uh, Ingham and I are creating accurate nitrogen cycles so that people can understand what is going on because they don't. I mean, they don't even understand the fact that the nitrogen is constantly cycling and it's waste. It's fung fungal and bacterial waste that's constantly being cycled. So when you go above pH 7, that's why it's nitrate and below pH 7, and it's ammonium. They're just different forms of the same thing. Um, we talk about, you know, rewilding streams. Uh, we talk about, you know, bone saws, Sepp Holzer's site. We talk about Joseph Simcox horticultural solution and using crazy rare plants that no one knows about. Um, we talk about using new technology like this wheel pump that uses only the current to pump up huge distances. We talk about, you know, cars that don't require gas that are pedal power. We talk about solar planes. We talk about all forms of capital, which is really critical. And I haven't seen that in, you know, in any other uh, book other than, you know, um, Toby Hemingway's uh, Permaculture City book, uh, Restorative Circles. I've never seen this in a permaculture book, but man, this is permaculture, nonviolent communication. We've got case studies on, and, and we've got feedback from people like, you know, Polyface, Joel Saladin. We're, uh, we're featuring people like Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, Wangari Matai. We have Jeff Lawn giving his inputs, uh, contributing, and we got case study on Zaytuna Farm. We've got case study on Al Beta uh, project in Saudi Arabia where they're working with less than three inches of rain a year. We've got Mark Shepard involved talking, and we're talking about uh, his case study on his Wisconsin farm, which is the oldest, largest farm, uh, permaculture farm in America. And he's also Organic Valley, part of that consortium of farmers, which means he's mainstream, which means this is mainstream. And so this is, and th this is also one of the most exciting parts. I'm working with John D. Liu and uh, I've got images and a case study on the Los Plateau project, which they repaired, you know. There's 14 more case studies, over 20 peer reviewers who are experts in their fields from all over the world. Uh, we have updated and accurate information, sourcing real life examples in science. The soil section from Bill Mollison's book from 1989 um, 
is really just moot in comparison to uh, the, all the research that has been done uh, by Elaine Ingham. And you can even read in the beginning of his chapter, he's like, it's the apologia at the beginning of like uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. You know, he's saying like, we're looking for someone to bring this all up to date and Elaine Ingham's it. And I just feel so unbelievably grateful that she was able to participate. And there's so many people like that, like Larry Korn, One Straw Revolution, Masanubu Fukuoka's editor, you know, is helping too. So that's not all. It's so exciting. I would kept going, but that's not all. We got permaculture chickens. Justin Rhodes is involved. He's a good friend of mine. I'm lending uh, my books to his efforts. He's lending his video to my efforts. We're working together. He's a good friend. Um, permaculture chickens this is a two and a half hour film. This is, uh, it comes with a 300 page book. Um, this, I mean, this is a $50 value. He's throwing this in for us. Um, we're talking about today's offer. We've got the books, we've got the course, and we've got his book and his movie. So this is a huge start. This is a huge liftoff rocket pack for anyone who wants to understand permaculture, apply it to gardening, apply it to every aspect of their life, start making money. Things. If you want the holistic answer, the solution to your issue, this, this is where you're going to find answers. So are you ready to start living regeneratively? That's the question. That is the question right there. So Raleigh should have the link up here in a second. I'm really, really excited that you're all here with us at this time. Uh, this is a very special thing that we've got going on here. And Raleigh, you there? You're taking over? Oh, yeah. Well, the link, All right. if you look at everybody who is interested in Matt's awesome course, it's up on the top right part of the screen. You can check it out. It's the Permaculture Student Online. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I'm so stoked to check that out. So I wanted to really, man, what a, what a cool presentation. I know growing up in a place like Colorado and Arizona, we're going to have to deal with extreme temperatures that our answer, you know, that no one has ever dealt with before. And yep. I think I really want to bring on Matt because for our survival and for us to thrive in the future, we need to be able to deal with extreme temperatures. And for our, for our lifestyle, we want to do gardening in a way that's not going to make us crazy and not going to stress us out. So, Thanks so much, Matt, for the awesome presentation. So, um, unfortunately, Neil couldn't join us right now. He's in, in Saudi Arabia. His, his power went out, and it's one of the hottest days of the year. So he had to flee to a, actually a cave is what he just told me. He needed to go to a place with AC. Um, so I want to open up to questions. So if you typed in a question below in the last hour or two, uh, type it again up top. And now we're going to do some Q&A. So, so yeah. am, I, am I being heard? Oh, yeah. You get, okay, cool. So real quick, though, before, as you guys are formulating your questions, I want you to think about this. Depending on your area, you can apply these things. It's all about the solar energy. So if you're in an area that requires more solar energy, you're going to want more sunlight to penetrate, right? You can still throw so You can still go vertical, but it's about the density and then the, the amount of light. You could do things that allow in more light that are thinner leaves, right? If you're in a, a cooler climate, less light. There's all these different factors uh, and blends. And it you know depends on what part of the, the property you're doing it to. So just think about all that, right? So first question, here we go. What are the cheapest uh, automated sprinkler systems? Should I answer that one? All right, I'll answer that one. Um, so uh, the automated sprinkler system, um, I just went on uh, Amazon and looked at the three port timers. There's not very many left um, and they just, their price went up, but early in the season they were cheaper, um, but there really is a limit. What happens is you, at the three-point timer, there's like a two or one version of it too. But uh, if you just look it up, there's really only a few options. 
Um, and at that point, you, you, if you go up higher than that, it's way too much money. So you'll see there's like a sweet spot. Um, and yeah, I would just do that. Um, and it also depends on where you are. I mean, in your area, you may you may have a hookup on Cheaper's Wrinklers, you know, than Amazon, who knows? All right, so uh, this is the question. So Raleigh, you want me to answer each uh, question? I see, I get it now, format understood. All right, uh, next question. How can I chop and drop any type of weeds? Uh, should I let them dry before mulching? No, 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 no. Okay, we chop and drop before it forms seeds. If it's already forming seeds, it will finish with the amount of energy already in the plant. If you've done this a few times, just watching, you'll see it happen. So you would chop it down and then um, you would lay it down, but but the seeds will continue to, uh, to finish and then it grows weeds again. So you have to chop it before it, it, it forms. It forms. Um, things that are windblown like uh, dandelions, I really don't care about because I, I, they're going to get blown over, uh, everywhere from all over anyway. Um, and I can just pull them out because the soil is already so loose. So uh, next, um, what type? What does brittle mean? Oh, okay. So brittle is a, a concept by Alan Savory. It's a scale. So on one side, you're non-brittle. You cut the ground and it heals quickly. On the other side, it's very brittle. You cut the ground and it spreads and it doesn't heal. It spreads desertification. Does that make sense? So we're all somewhere between that scale. And I'm on the brittle side. So when the ground gets cut, it's really cut. Uh, hopefully that makes uh, answers your question. If you have more uh, questions about that, check out Holistic Management um, uh, by Alan Savory. Okay, Bash, regarding perennials, how much of this applies or works when we use controlled climates in farming, gardening? What's the benefit of perennials in greenhouses, for example? Um, well, in your case, you're going to have to do a greenhouse just to um, establish certain things, right? So, um, I mean, you're going to have to play with it. I would create biological controls um, as much as possible in those areas because you're a resident in it so that if you have any problems, it's stuck in there with it and it's hard to, you know, you can't take it out of that situation. Um, and it's supposed to last, you know, years. Um, but yeah, that's an experimentation thing. I tend to operate outside. Um, that's the whole throw sewing thing is, you know, I would experiment with what uh, works with, with your area. And I would start with stuff you know is vigorous, stuff you know is a high um, yield to energy input. Uh, and start with small plots and maybe do do the whole thing that Neil did with 60. Do 60 varieties and then take the six best. Uh, I think that's a really good method. Uh, hopefully that answers the question, Bash. Thank you for, for coming. Um, it's always nice to talk to you. Okay, so next. Um, any ideas on controlling gophers? They're eating my moringa roots. Yeah. So uh, if you saw, I have gophers, right? Um, it's 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 really uh, it's hard when they eat your things. Uh, are your moringas close together? Are they spread out? Are they surrounded by other things that are delicious? Um, do you have enough volume? Do you have enough distraction going on? Those are the kind of things that usually uh, fights the, the critters. And then it's establishment. I mean, like how established is that Moringa? Is it young or is it old? Um, if it's an older Moringa tree, I'm sure that it would just regenerate. Uh, but if it's young, then that's the critical time period. You gotta nurse it through and you gotta use distraction. The chaos that you see that in my garden is also the chaos that they see. And that's why they can only just do what they can. But if it's set up in a row system where it's potatoes all on a line, they'll just go and eat everything in one day. And I know you guys have all experienced that. I did too. And I was like, why? But it's because I made up a monoculture. Um, and so uh, rules for growing are usually different for Florida. Will your Texan be able to grow different crops? They eat all the produce without spending much money. No, oh, well, it shifted. To grow different crops during the hottest weather in Florida. 
So in Florida, you're humid, so you're brittle. So um, you're going to be able to do fatter, more moist things. So you're going to be able to do tropical corns. Um, you're going to be able to do um, things that uh, can just – I mean, you're going to be able to perennialize everything and just leave everything. And you're, and Florida moves so fast that you're going to be able to move right into your food forest without really much protection because you have um, the moisture there already. Uh, but like the idea of the of the sun, the solar energy, yeah, the same exact thing will work in Florida. Uh, it's just the fact that you have um, more moisture. You're not you're not brittle. I mean, for you, you got year round growing basically, and you can do crazy crazy fun things um yeah awesome sheila florida so you have awesome things you're going to be doing i can't wait to see them any solutions that you know of for squirrels they eat all the produce without spending much money <laughs> wow so the squirrels are really good at not spending their money um so uh pff, we've got ground squirrels too um and it's about proximity to people and it's about um the crops you choose so I do my corn on this side of my hill and I do my sorghum on that side of the hill because this side has the, grow, or the ground squirrels in effect because they're bold because they're far away from us. But this side, they're shy because it's close to my front door and where I'm always at and the moles attack <laughs> me there. And so I do things that the moles uh, don't eat there uh, and then I, over there. You know what I mean? It's all about knowing um, what grows where what can grow coinciding with the squirrels or moles. And this takes, you know, some, some experimentation. Okay, what's the cost of the permaculture book and the, and the chicken video or link to this? Uh, I believe uh, the link, uh, Raleigh can send you the link, but I can do it right now too. Um, yeah, let me just do that for you, if that is what you need. So here, I've got it right here, got the link, and I'm coming back to you right here, right now. Okay, so I just shared the link. It's at the top of our chat bar there. Um, there we go. And what's the cost? The cost is on there, and it depends whether you're getting all digital or you're getting physicals with the, um, the digital of the chicken video and book. So when you discuss, when you discuss the tree canopy concept, which trees for my garden should I plant on the edge in a very hot, dry environment? Dry, dry place. I'm in Kuwait. Okay, so um, you're further along than I am. Uh, Bash and you are very similar, probably, because you're both in Kuwait. Um, I mean, you're going to be doing uh, palms. You're going to be doing uh, multiple uh, canopies. You're going to be doing uh, understory palms. You're going to do overstory palms so you get the vertical shade. Um, and then you're going to do you're going to literally create the succession. And this matters for anyone, anywhere. So you start at the edge, at the sand, and then you go through the succession, just like we, we saw. It goes bacterial, dominant. And then it starts getting bacterial, fungal. And then it gets more fungal. But it doesn't really get super fungal because it's the desert. Um, uh, and where are you going to get the wood lignin to feed that fungalness, right? So it's it, it takes a lot of time. Um, but but literally, that's what you would do. You would investigate what heals in that area, and you'd plant that on the edge. And I would go uh, research what grows wild, and I would make a wild, hardy edge. And this goes anywhere, um, anywhere in the world. You grow a hardy, wild edge that's edible if you can right? So that is stacking functions. And then you uh, have a sheltered area inside with the more sensitive things. Um, and that's the whole nucleus edge concept. Cool. All right. Um, question from the Netherlands, temperate climate, sandy soil. I want my soil mulched so I don't spend time weeding. But now I have so many slugs. Any idea how to solve this? Yeah, we had slugs arrive when um, when El Nino hit this year. And uh, what are they doing? Let's observe what they're doing. So you have all you. I don't want to spend much time weeding, but now I have so many slugs. Do, are you chopping in their, 
and they're living in there and in the chopped and dropped sections because that's fine um if there's slugs breaking things down um i don't know if i exactly understand the question uh you would use the weeds to start changing your sandy soil and the slugs are simply helping break it down um if your slugs are getting on your plants that means your plants need to dry out they need wind and they need sunlight those are, those are the two things that slugs hate the, the aeration and then the light there's just you know what i mean they want to be in the sheltered place where it's still air and it's moist so that that's what i would say is observe what the critters doing what they're doing because they're doing something positive no matter who they are in the scheme of things they're doing something because there's a need so observing that will really help okay sweet we put up both we both put up the link ha ha ha, ha. okay uh yes they live in the mulch but then go into my vegetable yes ha ha okay so what you're doing there um is putting the mulch next to the plants what i do in sections with annuals is i draw the mulch down into the path and then i'm walking on it. ever you got me so the thing is i keep the distance far and because and, and so what what is what happens is you end up having chopped tops and then surrounding your your plants so there are there there is some exposure there but what happens is it just it just allows enough heat and light in there to make a a barrier does that make sense it also may imitates trampling you know you're trampling the uh uh, the ground and yeah eric's right too you can get ducks um i'm not talking really in, uh today about animal controls or animal uh, inputs or an involvement uh, i just want to keep it gardening uh, most people have really small plots to work with less than a quarter of an acre so that's why uh, sometimes animals aren't an option and so i always just stick with that at least with this format all right are there uh and, oh there's a question can you visit um can we visit your farm in Yosemite, California sometime? I am thinking about doing a tour um, soon. I've, I've done tours in the past. I, I, I've done tours in the past. I'm just working on this book. <laughs> and this book is the most important thing that I can be working on right now. Um, because this book, uh, we just have formatting now and the last peer reviewers to read it and the illustrations to come in and it's done. And like I said, it's going to revolutionize things because it's gathering all. So Bill Malson came out with permaculture, uh, a designer's manual, and went, Pfft. and all these branches of permaculture appeared. You have Elaine Ingham and Paul Stemmets and you know all these different things. And people are like, is that permaculture? Wait, is that permaculture? Uh, and they don't understand that permaculture is a lens. It's a way of seeing the world through nature's eyes. So all I did was go back and, and gather the principles again and then show how all these new permutations are based on the original principles of permaculture. And I show how they brought new research and stuff in. Okay, so uh, more questions. Uh, do you have a percentage of nitrogen fixing trees in your orchard? Um, yeah, uh, Jeff says to go from 90 to 10. Um, that depends because I mean, are we talking about uh, nitrogen fixing trees? Or are you talking about nitrogen fixers? So he's talking about nitrogen fixers because otherwise where would the trees go you get that so in other words in, a, in, in in other words like it's annuals that you're planting legumes tons of so you're building up your soil biomass and nitrogen and everything and then meanwhile your trees are maturing including your long-term nitrogen fixers so you have to um, recognize that your annuals are ushering things in. Unless you're in the tropics and then you literally, the tropics, check out Ernst Gosch because I'm basically doing what Ernst Gosch is doing, um, but in the dry and he's in the wet tropics down in Brazil. And he has, and it's also in my book. Um, <laughs> I do a case study on him too, because you gotta know all this stuff. Um, but, he, but he basically just like Willie Smith's has a secessional thing that makes money for farmers that leads to a permanent stable forest at the end of it. And I think, I think they're both like three to five years long, their secession. And uh, 
really hardly any of it is annual. It's all perennial, and they're just chopping it to pieces. And it's and the thing we when we say perennial, we have to re realize that like I mean, the the tropical parts of the world basically are perennialized because they're constantly getting heat. I mean, they don't have uh, a fermentation winter. You know what I mean? Yeah, Ernst Gosch is the man. Um, so uh, pew, pew. I hope that answers your question. It's like, yeah, I have tons of nitrogen fixtures. Nitrogen fixing trees, I do the Napa method, which is what um, Stefan Sokobiak or the Permaculture Orchard does. And he's also one of the case studies and one of the peer reviewers. So I, again, they're all we're all working together. So Hugo culture. All right. So um, Hugo culture is for dealing with excess wood. And uh, in this area, uh, we have a lot of thinning to do um, because of all the fires uh, and because we are we didn't manage it with fire and we let it overgrow. And, uh, and then we removed all the water from above us from the snowmelt. We've been giving that away to farmers in LA and San Francisco uh, for so long that um, we've literally caused a manual desertification of our region so we do need to use uh hugo cultures um but as a gardening technique they're better in my area as a home for ground squirrels um they love it it's like the creme de la creme for them um and it really has to do with the fact that you have to have enough moisture for fungal um hyphae form and all that they need moisture. I know they create moisture. Everyone's very excited about how they create moisture, um, but they need moisture. So I'm not a. I'm not like I like Hugo cultures totally, but I'm not do, going chopping trees down and doing them right now um, because they're. I've had very limited success with them. Um, okay, so which uh, which plants work best with throw sub? Okay, so um, I've got sorghum that birds eat. I've got sorghum that birds don't eat. And a lot of this has been researched and they have it written on there. Um, I've got, uh, I mean, pff, what plants don't work? Let's let's reverse that. What plants don't work uh, good throw and so, throw so? Um, I would say corn can be problematic depending on your bird um, pressure. Uh, last year I throw sowed corn and it went well. This year I throw sowed corn and when it sprouted, it got attacked. Uh, that new sprout smells really good. So um, it depends and it also depends on if you can do it two years in a row. Because they learn. The animals are not dumb. They are very, very smart and you can learn a lot by observing them. Um, so uh, I think small seeded grains work excellent. I have found that uh, squash works really well. Um, anything vigorous has the possibility of taking off. And um, yeah, the birds are crazy. And I've always worked with birds. Um, but at the same time, what does a bird do when it comes to eat your seed? It comes down. Any seeds or anything that it's carrying, it's going to drop. And when it lands, it goes to the bathroom. So it's, and then you get nutrient, which is phosphorus and nitrogen, right? Because it's foul uh, manure. <laughs> That's funny uh, or punny. Um, and uh, they're taking that seed, but they're giving you um, seeds and they're also giving you nutrients. So there's this exchange that happens. That's why I feed them the millet. Uh, could you address deer more? They, they, they literally eat at the edge of the, uh, the amaranth, Eric. The deer, um, oh shoot, I skipped Scott. I'll go, all right, I'll come back to you, Scott. Uh, er, but like the deer literally eat the uh, the amaranth and the amaranth regrows so fast that it's there again when they come back. I, I kid you not, it's not so. All right, Scott, I'm sorry about this. I have super sandy soil to the point where grass doesn't even grow. I resorted to straw bale garden, but really want to be planting the soil. What do you recommend? I start started to be able to plant in the soil again. Very good question. Okay, you need legumes and possibly clay. So um, to establish in the desert, I only know three people who have really done this. Um, I'm sure Ramos Kent has, but uh, Neil's done it, Jeff's done it, and uh, Elaine Ingham's done it. Elaine Ingham's done it the fastest. She used uh, palms and compost tea and, uh, and mulch. Um, 
but what I would say is, if you can get mulch, get mulch. But nitrogen fixers, clay, um, if you can get it, um, you might not be able to get it. But nitrogen fixers are the key to that. You have to have nitrogen fixers in the sand to to to, to even put anything else in. It's their it's their root systems and the and, and the bacterial relationship that they create that creates everything else. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, I know um, that Neil is going to come back on uh, soon at some point and do another course, a book, or another webinar, or all three. So uh, he'll he'll get uh, more into detail on uh, on that. But I personally, um, I I I would use legumes. Or I would use wild plants that are growing in that in that region in those kind of soils. Okay, so uh, a deer, right, right, right. So um, yeah, and then there's also the um, bone sauce, the Holzer bone sauce that you can paint on your trees to keep the deer off. Uh, I know that that's taking off more and more, and everyone's kind of coming up with their own name for it. Oh dear, deer sauce. There's deer soup. Is you know all these people come up with different names for it. Uh, goat. Uh, there was also goat sauce that someone did. Um, so yeah, those are there's many many options for protecting your trees uh, from deer without fences. And in my book, I even go uh, through um, how sap mixes uh, fine sand in with manure with his bone sauce. When he paints it on, it creates a fine grit. And so the deer, when they lick it to get the bark off the tree, you know, that's what they do with their abrasive tongues. They get glass in their teeth and then they're like, ah, and then they freak out. Um, Sep thinks it's hilarious. Uh, and that's Sep for you. Um, but, uh, but that's an option, of course. Uh, it doesn't really hurt them. It just scares them. Um, uh, goats are vicious. Yeah, they are. Mm-hmm. But they taste delicious. So use goats uh, to uh, uh, or, or sheep to like clear the land and prepare for your. Um, you know, there's the session with grazers. This is also in my book. You guys, you know that you clear the land with browsers, and they make the so like goats, sheep, and then cow, and then after cow, the sanitization. This is Joel's method, Joel Salen, and then you have chickens spread out the cow pats. Then you have turkeys follow them, and then you can stay on that cow, chicken, turkey thing, or you can let it all grow back and then bring back in the goats and sheep. So that's the grazier cycle, which is pretty cool, and that's also in my book. Uh, my book really is uh, it's the place where everything is. Like so, like I just like refer to my book now because I'm taking all these, I have over 30 different permaculture, the best of that, you know, for so many different books. And I'm literally just taking all the information and combining it into a textbook format and then calling the authors and asking them to read the section over. Um, and so that I, I properly scaffold to their work. Cause a lot of, I mean, I, I know this is the case for a lot of people. The books that you read in permaculture tend to be, um, like read like a college textbook or read like a textbook not written by um, someone who's trained in writing textbooks. And so it becomes difficult um, to apply these sorts of things and difficult to see the framework and the principles and then how to take those principles and apply them to anything. And that's really what I care about because that's actual learning. All this technique learning where they're like, hi, I'm from Portland and this is permaculture. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's permaculture in your backyard in Portland. That's not permaculture. Permaculture is a lens that applies to anything. And you can't claim that that's what, you know. So uh, it's really exciting because people all over the world are really going to be able to apply it in a totally new way. And it's going to be business. It's going to be, you know, family. It's going to be government. It's going to be everything. And it's, it's just thrilling, really, really thrilling. So sorry, I was asking about fruit tree damage. Uh, could you dress deer more? Huh. Uh, I was talking about true tree damage too. Um, you paint the tree with the uh, bone sauce um, and that prevents them from eating the tree. And then um, and then uh, you, you, you do the edges, the living edges, the living fences, and they eat at the edge and they don't go further in. And uh, if you leave a fruit tree on the edge of your system, yeah, they'll prune that thing for you. They'll, uh, 
they'll clean out that fruit for you. Uh, mine certainly have done that uh, with trees that are over on the other side of the hill. Um, the pear tree is right on the edge. And I didn't plant it. I just went there to save it because it was literally planted in, in cement. And it didn't grow until I uh, did swales. So um, I live on very restricted water. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Don, uh, can you tell me where exactly you live? Because dry farming means different things in different areas. Because um, it's like, okay, in my area, dry farming, um, I skip back, huh? No, we're, we're with Don. So, Don, uh, dry farming in the Midwest means it, it rains every week. So they just throw the seeds in the ground and it grows great. Uh, dry farming um, in the West means that, um, well, if you're up in like Sonoma County, that means that you don't water because the water table is so high. Um, and then uh, dry farming down like in Saudi Arabia or like Arizona um, really has to do uh, with timing. So you're going to be growing in winter, and then you're going to be doing concave beds, right? Pit pit growing, um, and then um, you're going to be growing traditional things. So you're going to be growing corn that they're still growing in those mountains, right? You're going to be growing um, squash uh, that that can grow in those kind of temperatures, and you're going to be growing smaller traditional squash so you're going to have to go back to what they did uh, in those areas with the native americans and just so you know with tomatoes tomatoes are a desert uh, plant to a certain degree the yellow ones i've gotten to grow uh, the yellow pear ones right i've gotten those to grow in gravel with no irrigation in summer uh, and it gave me like six or seven fruits i have those seeds of course um, but like, that's the thing is we need to pick the right plants and Joseph Simcox, his horticulture solution that I was referring to is really about selecting what traditionally was growing in those areas and reviving them instead of adapting everything. So I do adaptation and I also do resurrection of older crops that aren't around. So I do both and I use land races because they have the most genetic variability to work with. So they're the most stable. Uh, and they have the most keys to unlock your climate. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Um, so Don, uh, only 19 inches rain. Yeah, you're just like me. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, what? So what's your soil temp like, Don? All right. Well, just get back to. We'll get. I'll get back to you, Don. But yeah, I, I'm the same exact thing. Um, you're just high and dry like me. Um, so uh, I'd like to know more about inoculating cowpeas. Do you make your own and how? No, I don't know how you would make your own. That's a really cool idea. That would take a little bit of research. No, I just bought it. Um, and I only bought it once um, because uh, it gives you so much in the package. So I've just I've used it two seasons, mm, three seasons now. I'm getting old, um, and so uh, yeah, I I just bought one little thing and I'm just constantly using it. So I just bought it at a garden store. Sorry if that wasn't as informative. Um, so yeah, Don, um, you're gonna have to trial things. You're gonna have to do research, um, and you can make things that are awesome and livable. Um, it's about changing your diet and about using those older things. And that's, you know, that's a hard thing if you've got a family. Uh, we could live off the land uh, where I'm at right now. Uh, it just would be a lot of mustard, a lot of bitter things, which I love. But uh, my five-year-old, you know, he's got some strong opinions about some of those foods. <laughs> and, you know, we love him and, and hope that he comes around. But, you know, that's just that's just where he is right now. And there's a lot of families have stubborn little eaters that, you know, won't eat certain things. He'll eat pears all day long, but he won't eat a strawberry. You know, that's just the way it is. But he'll hold a strawberry and walk around the garden with it all day. So who knows? Uh, uh, what is the best seeding or planting method for perennials? Um, 
it completely depends on the perennial. Uh, annuals are the things that we controlled and dictated for so long that they're they're really understandable and they fall into these categories. But perennials are like libraries of genes compared to um, the genetics of annuals. So we're talking about trees, you know, like chestnut trees. It's like they're designed to live hundreds of years. Uh, baobab, you know, over a thousand years, olive tree. Their, their, their genes are just these magnificent tapestries of information. So um, they're, they're, they're very unique and interesting. I mean, avocados, it's like, how did avocados originally start off? Well, giant sloths used to eat them all whole and then poop out the, uh, the seeds and their manure. And then that would be how they grew in the animal's manure. And when we drove out the giant sloths, we be, had to take over with propagating those. And so we had to do it in a way. And that's why we had to suspend the seed in water Right, right. Uh, so it's all it's all specific, and it's all like uh, it takes a little bit of research. Um, and it's fun, and it's interesting. And once you do it, you don't forget it because you did it with your hands, and you lived it, and you experienced it, and you cared about it. And it's a holistic experience. It's not like a textbook. Um, so if you take my textbook, you do these things, you'll never forget, and you'll just start living it. And that's what it's about. It's about living these things regeneratively. Um, I like to know about, okay, can Canadians purchase this? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the key is if you want to purchase this and you're in Canada or anywhere else in the world is to email. And it says um, at the bottom of the page, it says that I take international orders. We take PayPal. We have all this stuff. Um, but email me um, if you would like to do that, and I, I'll just invoice you. And you just tell me which option you want. Um, but it, my my website doesn't allow my my cart doesn't allow for um, for international right now. They'll update. They'll catch up eventually. They'll realize that we're all getting along. And they need to think bigger. <laughs> all right. So uh, when going through the per um, yeah yeah yeah, like I said, Neil, you'll be able to uh, just follow the. Uh, just email me. Uh, I can't get to say Neil. Or wait, should I do reply? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can do reply. Uh, just email us. Sweet. Uh, do, do people feel like their questions have been answered? Are, are, are people ready to dive in to, to take the next step? Are we excited? I'm excited. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for, for coming, Raleigh. Thank you for having me on uh, this amazing format that we can worldwide communicate and get better at gardening. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, well, all right. We got one, one last question from uh, Anthony. How about we do this? You're, uh, you can answer, see, two more questions real quick, Matt. Mm, yeah, I can do them. All right. So Anthony, the thing is what you want to do when you plant densely like legume trees. So like I've got, um, I've got this legume that I, I, I harvested wild off of from Big Sur and I just like throw, I just throw like the seeds and they grow. And then what you do is you walk around with your chop and drop, you know, knife when you go through later and you just chop the ones you don't want. And then now they're mulch. So I mean, it's all about having enough seed, and if you grow the right things, you get too much seed, and then you have friends for life because you're giving away your seed, and you've got seedlings everywhere, and it, you just have to get over the hump, and then there's tons of stuff on the other side. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, information on perennial staple crops, but I have a hard time finding info. I live in subtropics in Florida. Um, specific crops for carbon farming, uh, staple crops would be the best subtropical um, database that I know that's been scientifically tested is carbon farming by Eric Tonesmeyer. And that is uh, something that I source and I uh, refer to in my book. Um, and it's like a college textbook. It's, um, I think it's like $75. Uh, it's hard cover. It's, it's very nice. Um, but it's, it's pretty narrow. It, it's focused on sub, the tropics and the subtropics. So that would be a great option for you.
And I think that's it. I think that's it. Thank you guys so much. It was it was great to have so many people respond and be so positive. And I just feel privileged to be here to share this information with all of you and just really be a conduit for all these hardworking individuals who have been doing it for decades. I'm just a teacher and a, a curriculum expert. So that's what I'm here for. Awesome. Man, thank you so much, Neil. That was excellent. That was so much fun. <laughs> so this is what I want to know from you guys. I'm going to send you guys the replay link with, of course, the exclusive offer of the Permaculture Student Online. And we're going to have bigger and bigger presentations going forward. You know, but I'm going to need your help deciding who to bring on next. So because in the future, I want to bring on people like Willie Smith, Alan Savory, just like the biggest of the big ocean farming, things that you would never get access to in a webinar. So in the email that I'm going to send you, just reply and tell me who you would like to see and what subject you want to know about. Thank you so much for joining. I think it's a, this is the fifth episode we've done so far of the Sustainable Design Masterclass with uh, Neil Spackman and I. And that's, of course, is at sustainabledesignmasterclass.com. I want to thank you for joining us, and thank you for being part of a journey to the repair of the world we're in, because I believe we can always, no matter how late it is, we can design a better world. So thanks for coming, and I will see you guys at the next webinar.